Well, hello everybody, Mike Prevost from MikePrevost.com here. And you may have heard of the ketogenic diet and have asked yourself, what are these ketones everybody keeps talking about? So today I wanna to give you a better understanding of what are ketones, uh, how are they produced and how they're metabolized and what tissues, just a basic understanding and overview of ketosis. Um, those of you who've had a lot of biochemistry back, background will recognize that I'm simplifying a little bit and leaving out some steps, but we don't need to cover every single step in the metabolic pathways to get a basic overview of what's going on. Okay, let's get started. So understanding ketosis requires us to understand a little bit about basic metabolism, so that's where we'll start. So this is glycolysis, and this is where we metabolize glucose. And so we're going to start off with a molecule of glucose, which happens to be a six-carbon compound, and I'm representing it really simply here as glucose. And in, this is a very much an oversimplification of glycolysis, but the basic thing that happens in glycolysis is we split this molecule of glucose in half, like this, and we produce a couple of three carbon molecules that get modified and metabolized further and in the end we end up with two of these two carbon molecules which are called acetyl-CoA okay acetyl-CoA now along the way we produce something called ATP or adenosine triphosphate so adenosine triphosphate is considered the energy currency of the cell so what does that mean Think in terms uh, of an analogy, and the analogy I want to use is real currency. So um, our currency is the dollar. So, you know, we translate uh, work to currency in dollars. We sell things. We translate that value to currency in dollars. You know, we generate and patent ideas that are worth money, which we translate to currency in dollars. Well, the body does the same thing, except in this case, it's energy and ATP. So all forms of energy uh, in the body are eventually converted to or, or flow through ATP, which is the energy currency. ATP is the form, uh, the form of chemical energy that your body uses for just about all body processes. Okay, so, so the main aim of glycolysis is to produce ATP, and it does that through a series of chemical reactions that ends in the production of a couple of acetyl-CoA's. All right, so pretty simple, right? We, we break that glucose in half, we modify it a little bit, and we produce some acetyl-CoA's. And that happens, um, we, we shuttle those acetyl-CoA's into an organ inside of the cell called the mitochondria. And once those acetyl-CoA's are in the mitochondria, they go through another series of reactions in what's called the Krebs cycle, okay? So that's a basic overview. We produce some acetyl-CoA's that go into the Krebs cycle and along the way we produce some ATP. And so that's how we metabolize glucose. So let's talk about what happens to those acetyl-CoA's. You know, I said the acetyl-CoA's go into the Krebs cycle. Well, they do. So here we have our acetyl-CoA, our two carbon acetyl-CoA. And we have this other compound here that's a four carbon compound called oxaloacetate, oxaloacetate. So the first step in the Krebs cycle is we take this four carbon compound and we hook it up to this two carbon compound and we make this six carbon compound called citrate, okay? You know, it's not important to understand details so much, but the important detail we need to understand is that this acetyl-CoA combines with this uh, 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 oxaloacetate to form citrate. That's what happens to that acetyl-CoA in the Krebs cycle. And then the citrate is modified through a series of reactions. We chop a couple of carbons off, which come off as carbon dioxide. You know, so we, we end up chopping a couple of them off and we regenerate our oxalo oxaloacetate. And in the process, we form some ATPs. That's basically the Krebs cycle. And all this is happening inside of the mitochondria. All right, so the important point is our acetyl-CoA combining with our oxaloacetate. So that's how we metabolize glucose. So we start off with a six carbon molecule, we chop it in half, we modify it a little bit, we make an acetyl-CoA that is uh, pushed into the mitochondria, 
which then goes into the Krebs cycle by combining with oxaloacetate. We chop off a couple of more carbons, make some more ATP. So that's how we metabolize glucose. Well, let's talk about beta oxidation of fat. Well, we store fat in what's called a triglyceride, and a triglyceride is a molecule of glycerol with three fatty acids attached to it. There's a fatty acid chain, there's a fatty acid chain, and I've shown one here that's been chopped off, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So it normally has three fatty acid chains, and those fatty acid chains are normally 6 to 24 carbons long, and they can be saturated or unsaturated, but we're not going to get into those details so much right now. Okay. Now, in beta oxidation, when we start to use fats for energy, you know, the first thing we do is we chop off fatty acids. So here we've chopped off one of the fatty acids from the glycerol, and eventually we're going to chop off all of these fatty acids and separate them from the glycerol. This glycerol is going to go to the liver where it's going to be converted to glucose. So uh, maybe you didn't know it, but you actually can make glucose from fat, or at least the glycerol portion. But most of the energy in a fat is going to come from these fatty acids. And really simply what happens when we're metabolizing these fatty acids and beta oxidation is we just chop off two carbon units at a time, and that two carbon unit, through a series of a couple of chemical reactions, gets converted to our friend acetyl-CoA that we saw earlier. Okay? And that's simply it. That's, that's what happens. You know, we chop off a fatty acid, and then we start chopping off two carbon units at a time, and those two carbon units are converted to acetyl-CoA. And remember last slide, we talked about acetyl-CoA in the mitochondria going into the Krebs cycle. And that's what's going to happen. So you can see really that, you know, the end products of, of glucose metabolism and fat metabolism, you know, they both end in acetyl-CoA going into the Krebs cycle. So there's a common compound there. So, you know, here's the overview again, remember? So we can produce those acetyl-CoAs from beta oxidation of fats and also from breakdown of glucose from glycolysis. And in the end, it doesn't matter where those acetyl-CoAs come from. They're still going to both go into the Krebs cycle. They're going to combine with oxaloacetate, and they're going to make citrate. Okay, so that's normal metabolism. Well, so what about ketosis? So, you know, you probably know this, but a ketogenic diet is a very, very low-carbohydrate diet. And because it's a low-carbohydrate diet, you know, we end up with low carbohydrate stores in the liver. And so something really interesting happens in the liver when carbohydrate stores are low um, and when blood sugar levels start to drop. And that's the body turns on something called gluconeogenesis. So gluco is glucose. Neogenesis is to make new. And so the body's making new glucose out of stuff. <laughs> and the stuff is generally... Um, uh, generally uh, proteins and carbon skeletons of other metabolites. And one of the metabolites that it uses for gluconeogenesis is oxaloacetate. Remember, oxaloacetate normally combines with acetyl-CoA, but in the liver, during a ketogenic diet, because glucose levels are low, the body will shuttle some of that oxal oxaloacetate out of the Krebs cycle to make glucose. And so we end up with a relative shortage in the liver of oxaloacetate. So what happens when we have that shortage of oxaloacetate? Well, the Krebs cycle is inhibited because, well, oxaloacetate is needed, needed for the Krebs cycle. And because of that, these acetyl-CoAs are no longer combining with oxaloacetate because it's not available. So the Krebs cycle slows down and we end up accumulating lots of acetyl-CoA. It sort of backs up because now they're not combining with oxaloacetate and proceeding through the Krebs cycle. So we end up with an accumulation of acetyl-CoA in the liver. So under those circumstances, what does the liver do with the acetyl-CoA? Well, here's where we start making ketones. Well, what can happen is we get two acetyl-CoA molecules that join together 
and through a series of enzymatic steps, they become acetoacetyl-CoA, and then it's converted to HMG-CoA, and then finally converted to what we recognize as ketones or ketone bodies, acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. So now we finally have our ketones, and really what's driving it is in the liver an accumulation of acetyl-CoA's because we're, we're, we're turned on gluconeogenesis, which leads to a shortage of oxaloacetate. This is a process that's going on in the liver. The liver is where we're making our ketones. Now, you know, this acetone, it's very volatile, and so we pretty much, um, a lot of it is just evaporated in the breath. And so that's kind of interesting because um, now there's a couple of new technologies to measure or to estimate blood ketones by measuring really breath acetone. And breath acetone levels would be proportional to ketone production, uh, to the pr production of the other ketones, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, and that's why you can measure uh, ketones in the breath. So remember, all of this is happening in the liver due to a shortage of glucose because we're on a ketogenic diet, very, very low glucose uh, intake or very low carbohydrate intake. So now we've accumulated some, some blood ketones. Our blood ketone levels are starting to go up, and our blood glucose levels really challenged because we're on a low carbohydrate diet. So we may see a drop in blood glucose. So the body's going to shift towards metabolizing ketones for energy. And so how does it do that? Well, the ketones find their way to the mitochondria inside of the cell, right? And remember, the mitochondria is where a lot of energy is produced inside of the cell. It's a specialized organelle for producing energy, among other things. So our ketones find their way into the mitochondria. The acetoacetate is converted to beta-hydroxybutyrate, okay? And then the beta-hydroxybutyrate is converted to acetoacetyl-CoA via this enzyme, succinyl-CoA transferase, abbreviated SCOT. So I want to talk about SCOT in a minute, but it's an important enzyme, and uh, it, it determines which uh, tissues can metabolize ketones. So now we've converted our ketones to acetyl-acetyl-CoA, and then that acetyl-acetyl-CoA breaks into two molecules of acetyl-CoA. And remember from a previous slide, those acetyl-CoAs can go into the Krebs cycle and produce energy. Now, you know, one question you might have, and it's a good question, is, well, you know, we said that acetyl-CoAs are building up and they're not able to go into the Krebs cycle, and that's why we made ketones in the first place. So how can we use these acetyl-CoAs for energy here in the mitochondria? Well, the answer is we're talking about extra hepatic tissue mitochondria here. In other words, tissue that's not the liver. So the liver is producing ketones because it's engaging in gluconeogenesis, and so it has a shortage of oxaloacetate, but other tissues are not engaging in gluconeogenesis. And so they've got plenty of oxaloacetate and their Krebs cycle's functioning just fine. So we get a situation where the liver is producing ketones and other tissues are using the ketones for energy and they're using them in the mitochondria through acetyl-CoA. When acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle, we produce lots of ATP. So I talked about SCOT, which is uh, the important enzyme in ketone metabolism. Well, it turns out that the highest concentration, the tissue with the highest concentration of SCOT is the heart, followed by the kidney, the brain, and muscle, all of which have plenty. But the liver, on the other hand, has virtually no SCOT. I mean, it just does not have the ability to use ketones. And that's really a, a good thing because the liver can produce all the glucose it needs for its own energy um, because the, the liver has a high capacity for gluconeogenesis. And remember, it's even producing glucose from fat using um, that molecule of glycerol. But other tissues don't have that capacity, and so th they need the ketones, and so, so they have higher concentrations of our enzyme SCOT, and they're using the uh, ketones for energy. Well, that's a big picture overview. It's a bit of a short one today, but I just wanted to hit the high points of ketosis or ketogenesis so that you had a basic understanding of, of what it is. Um, you know, I hope you found it interesting and learned a little bit. 
Um, as always, if you have questions, head over to my website and post a comment or send me an email. Um, if you enjoyed the presentation, please spread the word. Thanks for listening.